Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We're good? Okay. Um, hi. My name is Dorothy, and I'm a software engineer on the build team at Twitter, and I'm here to talk to you about pants, but not the article of clothing, um, the build tool. So for those who aren't familiar, a build tool is what builds and runs your code. Ant, Maven, Buck, Bazel, SBT, which I'm sure you are all familiar with, are examples of build tools. Few build tools work really well in monorepos, but Pants has, happens to be one of them. You may not know much about how the software that runs your code works, so I'm here to tell you a bit about it. An important note, important thing to note, is that many build tools work with graphs to analyze the connections between parts of your code. These connections are called dependency relationships. There are problems that crop up when using multi-repo projects or organization that monorepos try to solve, and then monorepos cause a whole host of other problems that <laughs> Pants tries to solve. So having many repos makes dependency management really, really hard. But we can escape dependency hell by using monorepos and source dependencies. So how do we know we're using a monorepo? If you have a repo that has many projects that depend on one another and also uses source dependencies, which I'll go into in the next slide, um, then you likely have a monorepo. This is different from a regular repo because it doesn't follow the one project to one repo ratio. You can have tens, hundreds, even thousands of projects in one repo in a monorepo. The benefit of a monorepo is that it, it has easier internal management dependency, dependency management, <laughs> um, because everything is shipped together in one. It is easier to organize and navigate and cross-project updates are simplified because you don't have to worry about versioning due to the source dependencies. So an off, a question I get a lot is, what is source dependencies and why do we care? Um, with binary dependencies, all of your dependencies have to be versioned and compiled. With source dependencies, they don't. So with source dependencies, we don't care about versioning. Could you imagine having a monorepo where you had to actually compile everything and version everything and then depend on that? That would be a nightmare for everyone contributing to that monorepo. So when you have millions and millions and millions of lines of code that all depend on one another, compiling it can be incredibly time consuming. You wait a lot. Um, I once worked at a company in Canada for an internship and we had a monorepo that was wasn't that large, but we had nightly builds because it would take 10 hours to build our master branch. It's a, a ridiculously long time. Um, and then testing made it incredibly difficult because yes, we could run a class of JUnit tests, but we had to compile all of the Java code. So I could get coffee, talk with friends, make lunch, make a few phone calls, check my emails, grab another coffee, and it would still be running when I got back to my desk. So what would have helped with this? How could we have modularized our code in a way that making it, running it and, and running the test would be quicker or faster? We could have used Pants. Um, Pants is an open source build tool built by folks at Twitter, Foursquare, Square, uh, Medium, and others. It's very similar and modeled after Blaze, Google's internal build system. Um, now open sourced as Bazel, and is very al also very similar to Buck. Pants is great for multiple languages, specifically those in the JVM stack. We have support for Scala and, and Java, and also Python. We have pretty good support for Python. I know you guys hate it, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> And it's great, it has great support for code generators like Apache Thrift. P 
Pants is graph-based. So like I mentioned earlier, it uses the connections that are analyzed between code as dependency relationships. Those are the edges. And then we have build definitions, what we call targets, as the nodes in the build graph. By modularizing the monorepo into smaller, well-defined parts, you gain the ability to incrementally build your code and you can ta cache task level resu results in a build cache. A build cache contains any artifacts that we've downloaded or the re results of previous runs. With these, your build times are likely to compile, or likely to improve. All these words, sorry. Um, likely to improve. Um, but there may be times where you miss the cache and you have to rebuild and that might take longer. But with Pants, you get continuous cross-project integration testing and easy consumption of changes no matter where they happen to be in the graph. Because Pants is a build tool, we're constantly looking to improve um, our users' efficiency. We are constantly looking at improving build times and how we can do that. So what I will be going over today are strict dependencies, which is a feature that we've been building uh, to primarily help with compile times and remote execution, which is used to help compile and test times. So strict dependencies is kind of jargony, um, but it, it is exactly as it sounds. It's making your dependencies more strict. Without strict dependencies, dependencies are transitive, which is totally fine in a monorepo that is a decent size, but as you can imagine, you're adding tons of code over years, and your code can grow to a thousand times larger than it was. With transitive dependencies, you're now putting a thousand times the number of things that you were on the class path, which makes the compiler slower. Um, so to combat that, we restricted what we were putting in our dependencies and therefore on the class path. And this helped compile times. With less dependencies, we didn't have to scan and load all, like a bunch of things. Uh, we had, we it took less time analyzing files in the compiler and it improved cache hit rates because we had less dependencies. And those dependencies are part of the cache key for a result run, run of, result of a run. And with reducing the number of dependencies, you're now reducing the variability in your cache key. Finally, the whole JVM will end up going to strict dependencies once JDK, JDK 9 becomes the standard, and it's good to be consistent with that. So the changes we had to make for, with Pants, we're going from a transitive system to now a stricter system. We had to change the way we were traversing build graphs to be able to accommodate for this. We also, and this is a good example of what transitive versus strict means. C could be implicitly used in A, whereas with strict dependencies, you couldn't do that. You only, you had to list anything that A is using in dependencies for A. With a caveat, we did have to implement something called limited transitivity, which only worked one level up, and that was to make library owners' lives easier because it can be very difficult to be a library owner and have everyone change your dependencies because they need your, you, your library. Uh, we did see improvements with strict ups, but it came at a cost of developer time, mainly because of the shift in thinking that was required, and because, right, and because the compiler outputted some ridiculous errors when dependencies were missing. To address that, we invested in creating tooling for our team and users to more easily identify dependencies that were being used in their code 
but not listed in their dependency list. And we also invested time in calculating the performance improvement, and we found that on average, compile times improved by 10%, and cache hit rates improved by 20%, which is quite notable. On to remote execution. So remote execution is still in progress, but it's available in open source pants. So you can contribute to it and um, access it and use it now if you'd like. Uh, the idea behind remote execution is to kick parallelism into high gear. So we already run anything we can in parallel locally, but we're bounded by the number of cores on the machine and its processing power. By building on the remote servers, we can improve that significantly. We're also improving variability of the builds or reducing the variability of the builds that locally building creates and we're increasing authenticity because we know where the servers are, we know that they belong to us, we know what's on them. And finally, remoting provides a user, sim a simpler user experience because most of, of the things are hitting, hidden on the servers. You might be wondering how, we, how Pants knows what's parallelizable, and that is through the graphs. Uh, the leafs of the graph are what we know for certain can be parallelized. And there's other things that we use to assess, but that's the main thing. So Pants' remote execution system is very similar to Google's. It's actually modeled after Blaze, uh, and now Bazel has open sourced that. Uh, we had originally written our own API, but when Google open sourced their API, that was very similar, we decided to go with theirs to, for consistency across the open source community and just to you know, play well and show our support. With remoting in its simplest form, Pants works by splitting up the work needed into requests via the API that sent to the remote server from the user's laptop. Then the remote server will send it to workers. It has all the necessary information to be able to do the work. Once complete, the workers will report it back to the server. It's cached on the server and then reported back to the user. Unfortunately, I can't say exactly what the performance improvement is. Four times, 10 times, no times. Um, but because it's mainly dependent on your build graph. So for a simple example like this, we know case A is faster than case B in this situation. If you were to run this locally and remotely, they would be the same. However, if you imagine case A and case B as leafs of more complex, larger graphs, and instead of three, one and three nodes or leafs, you have 100 and 1,000. That is a huge difference in build times. At that point, your build time is the time it takes to complete the longest running part, the longest running piece. With all of the changes that we've been making and implementing, uh, we are hoping to improve build time significantly. One day we hope to get, be building our monorepo in seconds versus the minutes for mid to large graphs and hours to very large graphs that we currently spend. Um, and this is a great step in that direction. If you wanna talk about pants, you can come out to me or you can follow me on Twitter. Um, DM me, I'm always open to talk about build systems and other things. You'll see that I have a very, a large amount of interest on Twitter. <laughs> um, if you'd like to read more about pants, you can go to pantsbuild.org. And if you'd like to contribute to pants, we're always looking for contributors and we have tons of features that we need help building, you can find us on GitHub at pantsbuild slash pants. Thank you. Questions?
questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so how does remote execution work? Like, do the remote uh, machines uh, pull from the repo and then do some work and then uh, like send the binary to you? So a user will make a request and that will just go up to the remote server and that will forward requests to workers, multiple workers. It's, there's no polling done. Um, the repo exists on the server as well. And yeah, there's no polling that needs to be done. But, they, but all of the source files and digests and everything that you, the workers need to be able to do that work is all exists, all exists in the repo, on the server, and in the request that's being sent as hashed. Yeah. If I make a Google brand, it sends my this. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, when they do the work, do they just like give me the binary? Um, it depends. It depends on what you're doing. Uh, if you're running tests, then no. If you're compiling something into a binary that you want to be able to deploy somewhere else, then yeah. And there's also a possibility maybe one day we'll be able to put, just say like deploy, build and deploy, and then it'll be able to do that work for you. You don't need that intermediate step of getting back the binary. Yeah. Um, you had talked earlier about um, inconsistencies in builds. What are yeah. the, what are the s sources of inconsistency in the builds and how does, how does remote execution help with that? Right, so, um, <coughs> Inconsistency, inconsistency happens on a user's laptop because you don't know what's installed on their, their computer. They could have something different. You know, there's, there's always something that causes some issues and then you try deploying it on the same OS but a different machine and all of a sudden it doesn't work, right? So with that, we're reducing that inconsistency. Does that make sense? About a year ago, Eugene and Stu from Twitter uh, put in a Scala Center proposal to uh, make some changes to Scala to support this uh, strict dependencies mode that you described. Yeah. And so that you know the uh, Scala change happened, the uh, uh, compiler plugin was built. Like it, uh, I sort of never heard how that all ended. Like was, did that end with success? No. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, not. No. Um, we had gone through cycles of um, it's just taking a really long time to be able to get out the changes that we needed to get out for our, our users to be happy with us. So we had to kind of implement Band-Aids internally um, to be able to deal with that. And then now it's been deprioritized, so yeah. Both band-aids, I guess. Um, you mentioned moving from a sort of transitive dependency model to the direct dependency model, and so at work we use Bazel, so same kind of thing. You have to try and explain to people what dependencies to put for their targets. And I was just curious what sort of tooling you had built, because that's often a pretty painful process for people, especially sometimes with runtime dependencies that have to be on the class path for like coding but aren't used during compilation per se. Like, what's what? what can you say a little more about your tools? Right. Um, so. The tooling was different for runtime dependencies and for compiled time dependencies. We didn't deal with runtime dependencies because we assumed people would already know what's runtime, um, specifically because we already kind of require that in Pants. Um, with, to your other question about what kind of tooling that we were building for compiled time dependencies, we would, we have a way of analyzing which class files belong to what targets. So we would run a compile, and if, there, if something errored out, we would do a whole class analysis of everything that was being compiled and see if, if there's some target that's, that we know it's related to but not listed in your dependencies. We'd say, oh, this target needs to be listed in your dependencies, yeah. The strict dependencies is the goal of that to um, cut down on build times by using stale versions of your transitive dependencies or to cut down on compile times by not compiling the 
things that your dependencies depend on and stuff that you're not really using? Not really using. It's, it's, we have a ginormous monorepo and lots of things were being pulled in that we didn't need. And it was just causing a whole bunch of time being spent analyzing files that we didn't need. So yeah, by cutting that out, we improve compile time. Do you see a future where this like plays nicely with SBT or like to use this, are we basically having to throw away SBT for our, our project? I can't answer that. Um, I think it really depends on the community and you know who we have contributing to Pants. So if you want, you want to find a way to play well with SBT, join our community, start contributing. We'd love to hear opinions. Yeah. We good? Cool. All right. If you have any more questions, you can always let me know. I'll be around. Thanks.